Welcome back to the No BS RPG Maker MV Guide. Today we will be covering a few more tabs of the database. Due to the length of the video, however, I'm cutting this into two smaller videos in order to make sure everyone can find time to sit down and follow along without feeling the need to pause it and come back later. The remaining tutorial should be out within a week since I have the majority of the video finished already. First, I'd like to apologize for the length of time it took to get this one out. Without going into details, I've been really working hard to pay the bills and that's taken a lot of time and energy. On top of that, I've gone through multiple scripts for this video to make something that was worth viewing. I have deleted scripts and footage, and as you can see in this video, there's also a different project file that I'm using as well. So at this point, the video is pretty much going to be put out whether I like it or not, because you know it's not fair to you guys to not have access to this video for so long. Lastly, before we get started, I'd like to remind you that I have a Patreon if you'd like to support the channel and get a few perks. Support is not required, though it is appreciated and helps me keep this channel running. With all that obligatory stuff out of the way, let's get right into today's lesson. If you're not following along from the last video, let's go ahead and click on the database icon. Click on the states tab and let's get started. This tab is for the different states a character may be afflicted with in the game. On the left side, you can see knockout, poison, silence, and all of the common staple status effects a player might end up with in an RPG. The first thing to point out is restriction. The options you're given here are none, attack an enemy, attack anyone, attack an ally, and cannot move. Other than the none option, each of these options will remove your ability to control the character who has been afflicted with the state. One thing to note about the attack anyone state is this is going to indeed cause the character to attack either his allies or an enemy with no input by you. And since it is random, do not confuse this one for the none state. Next to the restriction drop down, we have the priority. The priority determines the order in which the icons will be displayed in the status menu. As an example, if your character is afflicted with three different statuses, the icon that takes priority will be the one with the highest priority. This also means that ones of lower priority can be missing from the status window if there isn't enough room to show it. If two or more states have the same priority, the newest one to be applied will be prioritized. The motion and overlay dropdowns affect the animation of the side view battlers. Motion is for the actual physical idle animation the player has, and the overlay is for the animation that will play over the character, such as the hearts that are currently showing over your character's head on the screen right now. Moving on, we have the removal conditions. In this section, we can tell it to remove the state at the end of combat, or if we want it to be removed by restriction which essentially means that if another state that has a different restriction than this state is applied, this state will be immediately removed. Below this, we have the auto removal timing. Here we can remove the state after a few turns or set it to none in the dropdown to make this condition persist until it's removed by other means. The final options of note here is the remove by boxes. The first option, Remove by Damage, allows you to prevent your status from persisting after you take a certain amount of damage. Let's say that your character is afflicted by confusion and you want your player's character to snap out of it after getting hit. This is how you would control this. Keep in mind that the default engine will not allow your party to target each other in order to try to remove their status effects. This should be able to be resolved through plugins, however, but we will not cover that at this time. For now, we will just focus on the engine in its default state. The second option is Remove by Walking, and it does exactly as it says. On the map screen outside of the battle, the status can be removed by walking a certain number of steps. This could be useful for states such as Poison, or maybe another state that you'd like to go away over a certain time outside of battle. Next up is the Animations tab. This tab is where you will create the special effects for your battle animations. 
At the top, we have the general settings. You can set the name and choose the images that you will create your animation with. Below the images, you will see the position drop down. Changing this will change whether your animation displays in relation to the screen or the character that the spell animation targets. Head, center, and feet place the animation at either of those spots on the enemy, where screen will place the center of the animation directly on the center of the screen. Next to the position dropdown, we have max frames. This is one of two locations on the screen where you can set the animation length and frames. We'll discuss the second location next. Below the general settings section, we have the frame section. On the left side of it, we have the numbered frames. The final line will appear as dashes. If you right click on it, it will give you an option to add a frame here. When you're working on these animations, you will be modifying these frame by frame, and this is where you will choose which frame you are modifying. Additionally to choosing each frame one at a time, you are able to select multiple frames at once. If you click the first one you want to select, hold shift, and then click the next one. Doing this, you can choose two or more frames. This is useful for using the buttons on the right of the screen, but we'll go to that shortly. The next thing we'll go over is the animation window and the row of pictures below it. As you will see in the middle of the animations window, there's an enemy battler there, and the center of the frame window is located at the position on the battler that is set in the position drop down at the top. When an animation frame is used, you will see that on the screen here surrounded by a border. These are called cells. Let's create a new animation and I'll show you how to build your own animation from scratch. Set your name for your animation and let's choose some images. For this animation, I'm going to choose one. Let's choose the Explosion 1 image. As you can see, once you have chosen the image, it will appear at the bottom segment frame by frame. Let's set our max frames now. We'll just set it to 5 for now. Let's start to build our animation. Select the frame and select the first cell. Let's right click on the animation window and click New. Drag the animation cell in the window wherever you prefer it on the screen. Now select the final frame in the frames list on the left. Scroll the cells to the right and select the last cell in the list. As we did with the last frame, we'll right click click New, and drag the cell to the location you'd like it to be. For this cell on frame 5, let's right click on the cell and click Edit. Here you will modify the scale, transparency, blend type, and other settings that you can see on your screen. For this one, let's just set the scale to 300%. The next step is going to automatically build our animation for us. Click on the Tween button. You'll see the options available for you that RPG Maker can automatically adjust for you. You can adjust the frame range for the tween and the cells range, which go from 1 to 16. You can also uncheck and check any options that you feel will help benefit your animation. For now, we'll keep all the settings default here and just click OK. Looking over each of the frames, you'll see that RPG Maker added the in-between frames for you even scaling each consecutive cell for you. That's what tweens means, the in-between frames. Click the play button and enjoy the animation you just created. Now, there are other options here. Change target allows you to change the battler that is displayed on the animation window. Paste last changes the current frame to be the same as the frame before it. Batch will allow you to modify the current cells chosen within the editor window to the same cell. Shift will allow you to move each frame on the animation over by an offset that you set. Lastly, there is the sound effects and flash timing section. If you double click this, it will pull up this window. Here you can set the frame that this effect starts at. Next to that, we can set the sound effect. Let's go ahead and select the sound effect we want to use for this animation. Below that, the flash section will allow us to select what is affected. This will allow us to either make the target itself flash, make the screen flash, or even hide the target. 
For this, let's set the flash to target and let's give it an orange tint. Now let's set the flash to three frames and then we will click OK. You can also add another effect for the same frame. Double click the list and open a new dialog. This time we'll set the flash to the screen and let's set the color red. Now we'll set the duration to 10 and click OK. If we test the animation, we'll see the explosion go off, the enemy turns a tint of orange, and the screen slowly grows red and then back to transparent. Congratulations, you've made your first animation. Of course, there are other things you can do with this, but I'll leave you to play with that. For now, we'll move on to the next tab, the Tile Sets tab. The Tile Sets screen is where we set our map tiles for use in our game. As with the other database screens, you can see the entries on the left side. Each entry corresponds to a tile set that is used to create the maps. On any typical map, you will only have one tile set associated with that map, although you may use events to swap between tile sets on a given map if you so choose to do this. For now, let's break down the settings on this screen. In general settings, while name is self-explanatory, mode isn't. The easiest description for this is that the world type is what you would set for your world map tile sets, and area type would be for everything else. Directly below this is the images section. A1 through A4 are auto tile types. A1 is meant for animated tiles like water, clouds, lava, waterfalls, and other things. A2, you have things like your grass, sand, and dirt tiles. A3 is for the auto tile buildings. You will use A3 and A4 mostly for everything under the area type, but it is available for the world type if you really want to. A5 can be used for any further lower layer tiles that don't really fit with the auto tiles. B through E are your additional upper layers, which you can view by clicking on the tabs at the bottom of the image in the center here. Typically, you'll find things like statues, chairs, tables, and other things that you would place in the world. If you click on the button for each of these, you'll be presented with a list of tile set images that are currently important to your game. You can select any of them from the list, but always keep in mind to select the correct image based on what category A through E you have chosen, as it won't just automatically figure that out for you. In fact, it is strongly suggested that if you create your own art for your game, you follow the naming conventions shown by the developers of the engine to allow you to choose the correct images. Keep in mind, B through E can be interchangeable for most cases, and you don't have to worry so much about sticking to with the naming conventions for those if you don't want to. But now let's talk about the buttons on the right. The first of the buttons is Passage. Passage is the basic collision information. Either the tile is passable, designated by the circle, or it cannot be passed over, designated by the X. The following button is the four direction passing. This one is only used for the A5 normal tiles and the B through E layers. To get a good idea of what this will work with, let's select the inside tile set from the list on the left. Clicking on B, let's look at the rope and ladders. As you will see, the up and down arrows are there, and the left and right side appear as dots. What this means is that you can move up or down on these tiles, but not left or right. When you click on the dots and the arrows, it will switch between the direction being passable or not. This affects entering the tile from that direction as well, so if you cannot leave the tile on the right, you cannot enter it from that side either. Next up we have the ladder button. When you're moving up and down on a tile with this tag, your character will immediately face up, even if you are moving down. Make sure this is set for your ladders and ropes. The bush image is named a little strangely. If you look at the overworld tile sets, you will see the trees and the poison swamp include this setting. 
What this button does is if you step on this tile in the game, the lower half of the character will appear transparent to simulate that the character is walking in this tile rather than on top of it. Counter is a button that provides the map tile with a little extra functionality. A counter tile is designated by a diamond button. What this will do is allow the player to interact with an event that is on the opposite side of that tile when the trigger inside of that event is set to action button. A practical application for this would be something like a bartender on the other side of a counter that you can just talk to like you were talking to someone on the other side of a bar in real life. In addition to this functionality with events, it will also shift the counter tile down by 12 pixels. This is something to keep in mind when you create your own art assets for your game. Damage Floor gives you the option to be able to cause damage to your player's party as they walk over this tile. The damage tiles are designated by these little spike pictures. Lastly, we have Terrain Tag. The Terrain Tag button allows you to pick a number between 0 to 7 to allow your events to process details based on your terrain tag using the get location info event command. Upper layers will take priority with the terrain tag if it is set to any number other than zero. Thank you guys for sticking with me through this video. We still have one more video to go, however, which I will be releasing over the next week or so. As I've already got most of the work done in that video, it should be done in time. For your homework for this video, make use of what you've learned. Create a new spell animation and a new spell to go with it. Make sure to refer to the previous video if you need details on spell creation. Try to make this spell cause and effect that you create. Now, give these spells to an enemy that either exists or you can create on your own. Create a troop for it if necessary and test the battle out. For bonus points, why don't you also create a new tile set for a map? And if you feel gutsy, try figuring out how to add your troop you created to a map's random encounter list and play your new map. I want to see your creations also, so consider leaving a comment with a link to a video showing off what you did. With that said, thank you for watching this video. I've worked hard to make this video and spent far longer than I should have writing and rewriting this. If you appreciate the work put in on this video and it helped you, consider liking and sharing this video as well as consider subscribing to the channel. At the time of posting this, we are 10 subscribers away from being able to get our shortened URL for the channel. Additionally, if you'd like to support the continued work on videos like this, consider backing me on Patreon. Backing me on Patreon will give you free access to select asset packs that I have for sale on my itch.io store that you can use in your own game, as well as early access to these videos when they go live. Also, I stream art, game design, and playing video games over on Twitch. Consider giving me a follow over there and coming by. I try to stream every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The links to the Patreon and Twitch channels are in the description below. In the next video, we will finish the database so that we can move on to the other stuff. So keep an eye out for that one as well. Have a great day. Stay salty, friends.